Welcome to Camp Constitution Radio with your host, Hal Sherliff. This show is heard on WBCQ The Planet every Monday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Broadcast out of Monticello, Maine in Arista County. It is also heard on TuneIn Radio. And if you want to listen to it uh, while it's live streaming, you need to um, go to tunein.org or .com and You put in WBCQ, the call letters of the station, and the program will come up. Also, you can see it on our YouTube channel, Camp Constitution. We usually post them as we get them, probably within a week or so. And also, ipmnation.org, Saturday afternoons at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Anyway, thank you for uh, listening. And this show was brought to you by Camp Constitution, which, among other things, runs a wonderful week-and-a-day-long family camp. This year's camp will be held at the Toa Nippi Christian Retreat Center, and it's coming up in less than, um, less than two months, about a month and a half, July 2nd to the 9th, and we have all kinds of great uh, speakers and activities, instructors, including the gentleman that's online here, Reverend Stevie Kraft. How you doing, Rev? I'm blessed. How you doing? You sound like you're uh, trying to catch a cold on me. No, no, I, I don't know. I was out there cutting the grass. Maybe I got a little, I uh, guess some stuff caught my throat. But uh, I feel great. Lord, uh, touch him, Lord. I think I think I'll be. I think I'm fine. Anyway, um, uh, you and I had a really busy week in in Greater Boston, uh, and you got just got home uh, re- over the over the, I guess Friday night, Friday morning, Friday afternoon. You got home to right. New Jersey, and we brought you up to do some not just speaking engagement, but also to meet people, uh, do some radio shows, and also a cable TV show. So um, and we started off on a Monday afternoon uh, visiting the the uh, a monument to John Eliot, who was known as the Apostle to the Indians. He created the first Bible that was published in what became the United States. And Tuesday, we did a cable TV show in Quincy, Massachusetts, dealing with the race issue. And then uh, Tuesday night in Dedham uh, to a very small group, but nevertheless, um, you know, we did our best to get folks out, and then Wednesday I thought was probably the most productive day, where you and I were in studio at a radio station in an inner city run by an inner city church, the Pastor Bruce Walls Church, a praise, praise and worship radio. W. I'm trying to remember the call signals, but anyway, um, he actually gave us the, an hour, and he had me interview you instead of him interviewing you. Yeah. I thought that was quite a quite a breakthrough. And then we uh, did some did some visiting Boston. You went to the the African Meeting House, where you stood in the pulpit of uh, Frederick that Frederick Douglass stood in. Yeah. And we had a, met some nice people from the the Mattapan Roxbury area. Thursday was sort of a contrast from the Union Club in Boston, the monthly the, the weekly men's breakfast. The, the Union Club is one of the most prestigious addresses addresses in um, in Boston. And then. Uh, uh, interview with Chuck Morse, which, by the way, I just uploaded the interview on our Camp Constitution Radio. Uh-huh. Chuck is the lone conservative in a very left-wing Tufts University. And then we did the uh, talk about a contrast. He visited the Methadone Mile, which you know, we'll talk about, and then over uh, over to Worcester, Massachusetts, where we spoke to a Tea Party group. So give us your your thoughts for the week and what you got out of it, the good, the bad, and um, the ugly. So. Let's, uh, let's let's do this. Why don't we, for your listeners, why don't we start with Monday, and why don't you, basically, for each day of the week that we spend together in doing God's work, why don't you start off with Monday, because you, you know exactly, it's it's much more clear in your mind every place. Sure, yeah, well... well and I, then we'll I, I, work, work through with each, each event, and then I will be able to give comments, uh, you sure. know, as we go through the week. Well, Monday, I I brought you to a place in the town of South Natick, Natick, Massachusetts, where the uh, John Elliott, who was known as the Apostle to the Indians. Now, John Elliott was a uh, you know from England. He uh, was born in early like I think 1604, uh-huh. and he said you know he said our goal was to pro- propagate the gospel of of Jesus Christ, but they hadn't been doing as good a job as they he thought they had. And actually, the uh, the Massachusetts Great and General Court passed a law that says we have to get the gospel to the Indians. Right. So because when these people tell us that, oh, our nation weren't founded by Christians, they were all a bunch of humanists or what have you, this flies in the face of that. 
And exactly. He, and, and the thing that really spoke to me when I saw the the uh, the plaque, and I saw there was uh, uh, this church. A uh, matter of fact, the church that I believe he founded, and it was somewhat sad to me because as I was reading the plaque, and it said that uh, Brother John Elliot was the apostle to the Indians, and he actually learned how uh, to speak the Algonquin language and then translated uh, a Bible in their language, and they called him the apostle to the Indians because he had such a love for those people. But then in the next block, when I look at the church that he actually founded, I saw that they uh, were flying a, a rainbow flag. And I said to myself, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and I said, Lord, it grieved my heart, Hal, because I said to myself, wow, I'm looking at this this plaque, and I'm seeing that he was an apostle to the Indians, and now I see that the very church that he planted became apostate. So it literally went from apostleship to apostasy. So I'm praying, and I'm asking you, Hal, to stand with me, because Prayer is the substance that I use when things come up and situations come up when there's when 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 we seem like our backs are up against the wall and people say, "Well, uh, uh, at least I can pray." No, prayer must be the first thing, not the last thing, because I, right. every situation when we pray, things happen. That's right, and the, the church that was once a but I believe it was a congregational church. That was the church of Ma- the, the the state church of Massachusetts for many years. That was Trinitarian. It was a Bible believing uh, church, and it, it, over the years the the faith has has waned. And at some point, and I don't know when, my guess are probably mid 1800s, but it could have been later. It embraced the doctrine of Unitarianism, and the Unitarians rejected the Trinity of uh, uh, the Trinity, the Triune God. It rejected the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now there were a lot of people who got caught up in that, and they looked at they looked at the the, man, the condition of mankind, and they said they said that we 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 have to perfect man through government through government institutions. The problems with man, uh, uh, disease and poverty and ignorance and such, must be overcome not by an individual faith in the Lord, and then that the ch- the change of the individual. And that, that the changed person then, uh, with other people who have been changed by their acceptance of Christ, have become new people. Their idea was to have government in place to be the vehicle to eradicate all the mankind's evils. And, of course, they fell, very, fell, they fell short in that. And today, today that church is, even if, if someone who was a Unitarian in 1850 could see what it's become, they would be horrified. You're, you're was, absolutely right. You see, the main focus of that major era in with a uh, unitarian universalist is the fact that systems do not create uh, sinful people rather it's just the reverse sinful people create create systems <laughs> yeah. see so yeah. it was like I told another group we went to I believe on our last night together at Worcester we have to change the human heart because everything starts from the spiritual, the unseen, That's right. and works into the seen, not vice versa. And we can see that when you look at an angry mob, the, uh, uh, and you say, well, what's the spirit here? They want to damage, they want to destroy, they want to hurt, they, and you can't, you can't ration with an angry mob. You can't debate an angry mob. You either have to uh, defend yourself or stay out of harm's way. There's just no way. Exactly. It's much like uh, talking to a drunk, trying to reason with a drunk. You just have to yes them and, you know, neutralize their, their damage or just get them out of harm's way. Correct. Um, so uh, that was an interesting, and we did a little video. It was on my live Facebook feed about your commentary about uh, John Elliott. And the first Bible, now think how difficult it was. The Algonquins did not have a written language. And right. also, it also flies in the face the idea that all of the colonists, all they want to do is exploit the Indians. No, they had a burden. Now, there was lots of injustices over the years. No question about that. Right, right. But the early colonists, they actually bought the land from the Indians. The British crown only granted political, uh, political influence over the land that they purchased. They, were, they didn't just go steal it. 
they purchased it. In some cases, some of the land was sold that really wasn't the Indians to sell. You know, it's like if I'm on a park bench and someone comes over and says, hey, I'll sell you the bench, give me 50 bucks, and I walk away, it wasn't mine to sell. But I'm 50 bucks richer, and the guy thinks he's got a park bench. So that's sort of the situation. And, um, and uh, the, so he had to learn the language, and he obviously helped, helped from Indians that he had Christianized. I think John Sassamon was one of the, the early Christian Indians that helped to do that. And then he had to, um, he had to teach, he had to put, he had to put a, a, an alphabet to the Algonquin language. Then he had to teach the Indians how to read phonetically, of course. There was no look say. John Dewey wasn't around to confound things. <laughs> and, then, and, and then he had to publish it. I mean, print this Bible. It was interesting during what they called the King Philip's Wars was King Philip was an Indian. And the reason why he went by King Philip is because he wanted a, an, 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 an English name. And he also wanted to be under English law because he saw how just it was. Yeah. And, but he would not accept Christianity. So they gave him the name of a pagan king, King Philip of Macedonia. And his goal was to wipe out all of the all of the English and all of the Christian Indians, and many of those Bibles were destroyed. Today, there are only two left in uh, in the world, and one of them is in the South Natick Museum, and one of them is at the Massachusetts Historical Society or archives. So that was a great story, and I very few people that even know. You can imagine the sacrifice just to survive. Exactly. Tough enough, and exactly. then you turn around, yeah. The word that just came to me, you just said it, uh, how sacrifice and commitment. That is a 100% commitment. I mean, think about just the idea of translating an English Bible to English speakers, translating 66 books, taking, say, for instance, a King James Version and breaking that down into a contemporary paraphrase. That in and of oh, sure. the miracle. Oh, it certainly is. What this <laughs> brother did... And that's why it, it burdened my heart when I looked at that plaque and saw how committed he was and the love he had for the Algonquin Indians. And then to turn around and look at that church that he planted and saw that it was totally apostate. Total, totally apostate. It's not, I don't even know why they refer to it as a church. Yeah, well, right. on Tuesday, we visit our good friend Don Cusser, who hosts a show called The Constitution Then and Now. And it was a very engaging one-hour uh, conversation we had with Don. And I know that his uh, videos go up on YouTube. I have not seen them yet. Uh, and his show is called The Constitution Then and Now, and it airs on Quin- – Quincy's a good-sized city, just a, few, you know, just a short distance from Boston. And then we had it programmed that night. And – oh, what else did we do? Oh, that's right. I took you to some sites in South Boston. I took you to Castle Island which right. is the oldest fortification. It was also where Prince Hall founded the, the Prince Hall Masonic Lodge. Uh, that was a little historical uh, anecdote there. And we went up to visit Dorchester Heights, where Henry Knox from, brought the cannons from Fort Ticonderoga all the way to, to Cambridge. And then uh, it was a real mir- miraculous event. General Gage was supposed to fortify Dorchester Heights. And he just said, eh, no big deal, I'll, I'll do it. No, no rush, no rush. And uh, Washington, who was one of really his first victory, uh, was able to, uh, with, it was a, quite an effort to build a, build a barricade there in, in the minute with these guns. And the British realized, oh my goodness, we're now surrounded. There's a siege of Boston. And do we fight or do we, do we retreat? And they decided, they, first they thought, well, we're going we're gonna to storm Dorchester Heights. And a t- tremendous thunderstorm ha- happened that night. And if you read the diaries of the farmers and the people that kept diaries in those days, it was a, m- a thunderstorm that they'd never seen before. And after that, Howe decided it's time to get out. So he took, he promised not to burn Boston, and he did not burn the city. And they, most of the Brit- the, the Tories and and the British soldiers, went up to um, went up to Nova Scotia. And it, you know, it, unfortunately, as much as I love the city of Boston, I'm a lifelong inhabitant. In my opinion, today, I would say about 80 to percent or more of its inhabitants would welcome the British occupation, or in this case, a U.N. occupation. And it's sad. Yeah. Uh, again, if you look at the spiritual uh, decline in the state, no, there's always a remnant. And, uh, you know, you have to be optimistic. God put me here and uh, I'm going to stay here for as long as he wants me and try to be a little light and a beacon. That's what we're supposed to do. And. 
but but Wednesday I think was a really interesting day because uh, we got to um, Bruce Wall's radio station. Now yes. Bruce Wall is um, you, you got a, you were a little uh, apprehensive about it, not really knowing what we were going to walk into. And I'm just thinking, well, you know, God made it happen for a reason. I was very surprised that it, you know He offered us. Not, I was surprised that He would have you on as a guest. But to have me actually do the interview, that's, oh my, so hurry him in the studio is praise and worship. And now you know in the black community uh, that racism seems to, the promotion of racism seems to be a, ma- a major commodity. We pick up the Bay State banner, which is a primarily black readership. And any little thing that happens, uh, some drunken white fan, racial slur, and it's a headline to the newspaper. Well, Okay, it, it's not a nice thing. And the guy was dealt with. He was kicked out of the ballpark, banned for life. And and then the next day, the fans gave the the center fielder for the Orioles a standing ovation. He was the one that was the, the object or the, the victim of the nasty words. They gave him a standing ovation. But by reading the article, you thought, gee, there must be a Klan rally every night in the bleachers during the Red Sox game. And they were just total blowing things out of proportion. And it kind of feeds into people. So make some, if you could comment on that. Well, I was, uh, I, I, I saw, and I, I truly believe, brother, that God is moving in the inner city. Now, we have this battle with race because race is the original sin because of slavery that happened in the beginning of our nation. So that seed was planted at the beginning of the nation. And we have to understand that. That's, that's something that's deeply entrenched from the beginning of this nation. That's not something that's contemporary. So it's not, and Satan doesn't give up ground easily. And that's the reason why I constantly tell people the way that, the only way that we can neutralize, as I call it, the tar baby, is by avoiding it. Because it's a sticky situation that you cannot win because of its spiritual roots. It's, it's like an octopus that has that has tentacles going all over, and these roots are so deep because the roots go all the way back to the beginning, the very mm-hmm. founding and beginning of our nation. And what I saw at, the, at Bruce Wall's radio program, the fact that he had you, my white brother from another mother, interview me uh, while he worked aboard, that let me know that he is definitely open to the spirit of racial reconciliation. He's a minister of the gospel, He loves God. I came away from there feeling really, really encouraged. And I'm praying, this is a matter of fact, as I sit here writing, I'm going to put put that on my prayer request right now for God to put in his heart to give you a a, a show once a week. And then that that way you can have me on maybe, you know, maybe I can come up, you know, once a month because I love love being in a live studio. There's a different... It's a different environment when you actually... Oh, yes, yeah. It's a much... This radio show, we don't have a studio. It's done by talk show. And, you know, in fact, it's it, when I had someone in the same room with me, it doesn't work too well handing the phone over to someone else. So, But it would be nice if we were able to get a studio like that. You know, maybe down the road that God will open some doors for us. But meanwhile, we take advantage of the opportunities we can. And, exactly. and I've been on... You know, you and I have been on a lot of radio shows. You remember we were up in Maine back in, what was it, November of last year with Dr. Kishore and a station in Caribou, Maine. Now that's a long, well, not, a, you know, the show is based out of fur, further north than Caribou. Uh, oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. We, I took you to the station too, if you recall, WBCQ. Right. Caribou's north, uh, Caribou is north of uh, Monticello, probably another 30, 30 miles or so north. And it was a, uh, a small Christian station. Right. And the owner interviewed us and he, well, he was very pleased at what, what, what transpired. And, I was right, you know, so, and I've been on other radio stations. And by the way, I got a really good report. Uh, I was offered uh, uh, to speak at a rally, a, a Trump rally. Now, our, our camp doesn't endorse candidates. We're not there, you know, we're not promoting candidates, but Trump's the president of the United States, so it was a presidential rally. Nothing wrong with that. I couldn't make it because you were with me. I couldn't run down to, run down to uh, New London, Connecticut. So uh, Pastor Earl Wallace, who was uh, one of our instructors and on our speakers bureau, he lives in uh, near Albany, New York, but he was available. He went down there, and um, the, the the lady called me up, and uh, 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 Lori Cavanaugh, who had run for Congress, she has a radio show in New London, 
And she was just so happy. She said, thank you so much for, you know, recommending having Earl Wallace come down. I said, not only was he a blessing, but the fact is he pretty much took over. He ran, he ran the event because she was tied up in court dealing with permits. So that, that was an exciting thing. So anyway, so we, after the radio show, I took you to downtown Boston. You've been to downtown. I mean, you went, you were to Harvard, so you're not unfamiliar with the place, but, uh, I don't think you ever walked what is known as the Black Heritage Trail, oh, I and w- we went to. I did want. To, I wanted to take you to the African Meeting House. It's interesting too. When you hear the term meeting house, that's a term that was used a hundred plus years ago. Right. It always meant a church, but not only was it a place for church services, but it was a place for for political meetings, for speeches, for politicians. In other words, the church was the center of the community. Right. It wasn't a place that you just went in there on Sundays and then left, and the place is locked up for the rest of the week. Right. It was used by the community. There was a school in the basement. It was the first black public school in the United States of America. And, and you know, when some of these people today, a lot of these people, had, uh, oh, America's irredeemable racism, slavery, it was born in this, it was awful. What you're saying is the incredible sacrifices made by those men and women, white and black, to bring eventually, I mean, it's a long time, it took too long, unfortunately, but to bring to what, to what we have today, you're saying that their sacrifices were in vain in a waste of time, and you're better off someplace else than the United States. And you, you said uh, the other night, you don't like it here, I'll give you a one-way ticket to North Korea, to Saudi Arabia, to Zimbabwe. You think it's better there? And see, I, you, I meant you know. that because... I know that they know, the people who want to bash our nation, they want to do it for one reason, one reason alone. They want to destroy the only liberty-free country in the world other than Israel. They want to destroy America. It's not about they want to go somewhere else. That's they, right. Because if they wanted to go somewhere else, they would go. Nothing is stopping them. They want to destroy America, and that is, is what grieves me to no end. That's the reason why I speak stridently to that very issue and see, but I know what can work to neutralize a lot of this race nonsense, and that is salt and pepper. And what I mean by that for your listening audience is for people like you and I having a, a having the same mind because we come out of the same spirit of the living God, working together as salt and pepper to come against some of this madness. I understand why Mrs. Cavanaugh was so blessed and so excited that Earl came up there because, again, Earl is very articulate. He's very well-versed. He's, he's very knowledgeable. And for him, as a black patriot, conservative scholar, to come up there with the programs that he has done was really a blessing to her because, again, <laughs> she has not seen that, you know, to any extent. And for him to come, I, I wish... Uh, the president could have made it. The president wasn't there, we heard. But just yes. the, Earl was able to come up there and do that presentation. It gave Mrs. Kavanaugh great hope and great encouragement that if more of, 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 of uh, as we call the Motley crews, can be put, put together, <laughs> uh, we, can, we can start to break down and start to chip away at this evil spirit called racism. That's right, and um, I was as you were talking about Earl, I was just thinking you um, about a year ago you loaned me a DVD. It was a uh, a speech made by a a black patriot from Colorado whose name I forgot again. Uh, Willard. And, Willard. Um, I, I, his last name is Willard. I forgot his I forgot his I forgot his first name. But he runs the uh, the Black Tea Party conservatives out of. Uh, Denver, Colorado. They call them the Rocky and, Mountain of uh, Conservatives, Rocky what, Mountain Tea Party, something to that extent. He, well, he, he kind of he put a burden on my heart. Now, I've been involved in the freedom fight for many, many years, and I have over the years have you know had friends in the black community. I knew I knew Reverend Earl Jackson. Now he's Bishop Jackson when he was in Boston. Reached out to him and some people in his circles and others over the years. But I know it's a tough nut to crack because. Uh, but this guy said, "They said, Willard. He said, go to the, go visit that church, go there and show that you show con- concern. 
you sit back and say, well, gee, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to support me no matter what I do. I'm white. They're going to reject me. So R- Reverend, Reverend Wall, uh, Bruce Wall has a Facebook page. I friended him. We do have, we do have a, a you remember Mr. Nelson, uh, Bishop Nelson, we, who I've known for many years. He's got a very small church in, Hyde, in the Hyde Park section of Boston. So he friended me, and I would post stuff. I would, you know, didn't didn't agree with everything he posted, but I would, you know, make commentary, you know, respectful. And he he and I thought he's going to take it down and 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 unfriend me. No, he accept he rece- he accepted it. Exactly. You no, know, I think I think people of faith, people of goodwill, can have disagreements and air them without getting to name calling. And he had a lot of interesting people on his page, and sometimes I get into little debates with them. Anyway, he invited me to come out to the Save the Parking Lot uh, uh, rally. And the parking lot, it, you think, what's the big deal? A little parking lot in the, one little neighborhood in, in a mid, middle-sized city. Well, it was really ground zero for Agenda 21. And I came with Dr. Kishore, the third part of the Motley crew. And he saw me out there, you know, and, you know, in, in rallying their defense and speak, got a chance. And then that's when, that's when I kind of explained that yes, gentrification is part of the problem, but this recent drive is not just the gentrification, but it's Agenda 21. And and then he, uh, you know, that was hey, this guy's coming to my area, and then maybe I maybe I should uh, look into this guy, what he has to offer, just a little bit more, what he has to say. Maybe there's merit there. And I think I don't know of too many Tea Party that are mainly white that reach out, that actually try to reach out. It does happen in some places. But I think there's enough of it, and I was encouraged to do that. And, you know, sometimes you might get your hand slapped, or they may not. But you know what? The idea is you, that happens. You shake the dust from the sandals. But eventually, you're going to make some inroads. And the liberty message is so important. I mean, we're really serious about saving the country. We have to reach out to the inner city. Exactly. And, again, they, may, they, they have to understand that this Constitution, with its flaws, they, that it's the greatest document to promote freedom and instead of bashing the country because what you have – if you tell these people, okay, I'm going to bash America. I want to see it fall. What are you going to – you're going to be in there. What are you replacing it with? You see, exactly. it's almost like a – and they don't see that. They don't see that. I mean a lot of people don't see that, whether they're white or black. All right, I don't like the system. What are you going to replace it with? Well, Look see, around the world you know, the, and see what's you – know. See, that's the thing. They do, um, my belief is they do see it. Their objective and their agenda is not to find something better, but to destroy. See, Satan only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Satan doesn't create anything. And this whole movement of using race as the tar baby is for that one purpose. Because hey, race, Rev, Rev, because racism one never unites. If it we united, got, we, they wouldn't use it. So that's, that's right. the reason you know why the, the God has given us the means to work together as, as brothers and sisters in Christ across not only uh, uh, denominations, but especially across cultures. Because that's, that's right. the way you neutralize this mess. They have to see a white brother who loves God. You have to see a black brother who loves God. You have to see an Indian brother or sister who loves God. In other words, our, we have our motley crew, and then stand against this madness so that people who may be on the fence and don't really have, uh, you know, really know what they believe, they can then look at both sides of the thing, see, and then make a judgment call on where the truth lies. Right. Hey, we're running out of time, but what this was the ha- fastest half hour. Uh, we'll definitely pick it up again. But for those who are listening, go to Camp Constitution's Facebook page and YouTube channel, and you could see some of the presentations, some of the radio shows we did. And uh, thank you for listening. God bless you. And Reverend Kraft, uh, thank you for uh, coming on. Thank and you for until next me week, usual, uh, my brother from another mother. You, you are most welcome. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to Camp Constitution Radio on WBCQ The Planet. Until next week, good night and God bless. God bless.